Well, these are two very uh, rich um, presentations, so it's very hard to uh, respond to it all. I, I just want to make a few uh, points that I found especially attractive and uh, helpful. Uh, I and Bishop Irwin started off by uh, talking about the divisions that came about by the Reformation, and uh, I want to say a word about that later. I think that's something as we reflect on the uh, anniversary, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we need to look at that. I very much appreciated your, your, that wonderful picture of the crucifixion of Jesus and your lifting up the theology of the cross, the Theologia Crucis, which was so important to Luther. Uh, and I want to mention that also at the end. I thought that was a, a very important point. And I thought the way you went over uh, the, uh, the, 17, the, the 91 theses, the 92 theses, which I thought were in, in uh, German and they were in Latin, I was quite surprised by that, uh, was very, very helpful. I think you gave me especially a, a new appreciation of Luther and his concern for the, the conscience of the Christian. I, thought, I found that very, very helpful, uh, the, the way you did that. Um, I think that's probably what I took away most from, from your presentation, was this uh, appreciation of Luther and what he was concerned with, how he was trying to bring a greater sense of God's uh, compassion, God's mercy, God's graciousness uh, to God's people. And that was uh, especially important. And then going through the, the seven uh, marks uh, was very helpful because they were very similar. Uh, I heard a lot of echoes of the Augsburg Confession there. I remember when I first came here uh, a good number of years ago, the Catholic Church was thinking of look, recognizing the Augsburg Confession as a statement of Catholic belief, and I think it easily could do that, although it chose not to do that at that particular time. So I found all of those uh, very helpful uh, points uh, that you made in your presentation. Uh, in uh, um, Professor Gennard's uh, presentation, lifting up Creeds and confessions as a way to establish our identity, our religious identity, I thought was a very important point. Uh, so many times uh, our students today are not familiar with, with the creed, or when you ask them what are basic Christian beliefs, that's not their impulse to go immediately there, because we have this wonderful Trinitarian outline of basic Christian faith in, in the various creeds that we profess, especially the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. And so I, uh, it's very helpful to lift that up. But also your point about how we tend to uh, justify our own positions by condemning the propositions or the articles of the other was extremely important, I think, uh, because our churches have certainly done that historically. And one of the things that we're learning today is a whole new language uh, of how we relate to each other, how we come to appreciate differences in the formulation of Christian truth. And, and that, was, that was very, very important, I thought, in, in your presentation. Uh, you made a point of giving us the background to this very important 1999 uh, joint agreement on the doctrine of justification of the scholars getting together and getting to know each other. And, and that, to me, is a, my first principle of ecumenism, is ecumenism always begins in friendship. And when, when scholars and pastors and representatives of different traditions begin to get to know each other, and this is no longer the religious other, uh, but you know, Mary and John and Joseph and uh, all these people that become our friends, there's a whole new relationship established, and that's so very important. And you certainly made that uh, out uh, very importantly there. That was part of this process of leading to this doctrine of justification. Then a very important point in talking about rep re reception, the reception of ecumenical agreements, where we keep waiting for official responses from our churches uh, on these, these uh, uh, agreements. We, we have some 50, 60 years now of these ecumenical agreements, is how do we make them local? And you stress that. Ecumenism has to be local. And we have these wonderful agreements uh, between our churches today uh, but so often people in the pews and the congregations and the parishes are not really aware of this. They don't really see this, this uh, uh, agreement that is emerging. And while I think one of the really positive uh, effects of the ecumenical movement is that we have a totally different view of the other today, we still have to find ways to make uh, uh, ecumenism local. I think that's very important. And then you pointed out this differentiated consensus uh, in the uh, uh, Joint Declaration on uh, Justification. 
this is absolutely important for me, that we are agreed on the basic truths, but we have uh, different ways of expressing it, we nuance it, we have uh, particular emphases in our tradition, and we need to be able to find a fundamental agreement in faith that makes room for these, these differences that we have. Um, one concern that I have as someone who's been involved in ecumenism in, in a long time, for a long time, is where's it going to go today? Uh, I think one of the, uh, the deficits of the loss of Christian unity was once the uh, charism for unity was lost, the churches have continued to divide. So today there's a survey from Princeton University, a bastion of Reformed theology, that says we have 45,000 denominations today, and that continues to grow. If you look at 20 years ago, it was 30, then it was 10,000, and it, it continues to grow. It seems to me one of the problems was that the uh, lifting up of the principle of sola scriptura, even if Luther never used that language, and, and it's some question as to whether or not he really did, is that it's, it's separated the scripture from the church. Uh, and I think what has happened historically uh, is that we've seen more and more people you know, go off and, and begin their own churches because of a particular you know, appreciation of the gospel or of the Christian message or of how it's lived out in practice. And so the Reformation continues to divide. So as I look at the, at the global picture today, what do we see? We see this enormous loss uh, of the churches in Europe and North America. Protestant Church is even more than the Catholic Church uh, in this, this situation here where they're losing members and the, and the churches are really diminishing in terms of membership and, uh, and influence. Michael Kinneman says those churches that supported the, the, the World Council of Churches can't even afford to do that anymore because they've lost so many members. And seminaries are closing. Some of the most uh, distinguished, oldest uh, divinity schools in the United States have shut down. So in the meanwhile, we have this enormous shift to the global south. While the churches in the, the global north uh, diminish, the churches in the global south are, are mushrooming in, uh, in Asia, in Latin America, and in Africa. And, but these are very different churches. They're, for the most part, uh, evangelical or Pentecostal churches, or more accurately, they're really neo-Pentecostal churches. Uh, there's some question as to whether or not they're really Protestant. Uh, they don't subscribe to historic Reformation principles. Uh, they are no longer liturgical or sacramental churches. Uh, many of them preach the prosperity gospel, which would horrify Martin Luther with his strong sense of the Theologia Crucis. So uh, do we need a new ecumenism? That's one of the questions that I want to raise. Do we need a new ecumenism? How, when we have these churches that in some way have strayed so far from the Christian tradition, and yet are vital and, and growing uh, and full of energy and evangelical zeal, uh, what does this mean ecumenically? What does this mean ecumenically? This, I, th I think this is a, a challenge for all of our churches today. Um, one, or, one or two other points here, uh, one or two other questions. Uh, again, how do we make ecumenism truly local? That's, that's really a, a very real issue. And I especially uh, like, Donna, you lifting up at the very end uh, Hott's evolutionary view, uh, which you suggest is going to really affect our theology in very significant ways. Uh, I'm not sure we've always come to terms with that, but it's a very suggestive um, place to go as we look forward to the future. And one question I, I have here is maybe this means that sort of the historic Reformation uh, anthropology of total depravity if we see God's spirit working in, in the created world, if we see uh, reality as disclosing God in so many ways, we, we need to reflect, we need to rethink that uh, rather negative anthropology just a little bit. So these are just a few uh, uh, reactions on, on, I think, these very rich talks, and I thank you both for them.